Good <laughs> evening, everybody. My name is Dr. Abbas, and I'm a consultant physician, endocrinologist, diabetologist, based in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. I'm into diabetic food since 1992, and now more than 30 years. I'm a president-elect of D Food International and regional chair of English-speaking uh, D Food. I'm honored an opportunity to, uh, and to have an opportunity to chair this session. I should also like to welcome Professor Memuna from Dhaka, Senegal. She okay. is a professor of medicine at Dob University of Dhaka with over 20 years of experience in metabolic and endocrine disease. Yeah. She is currently head of internal medicine unit and director of National Diabetes Center in Dhaka, Senegal. She is a current regional chair for French speaking African countries and is a co-chair for my session. Hereby, I welcome you all educational Web webinar series by DFOOT International. I'm privileged to have honor to chair this flagship project of DFOOT International here in Africa, which is one of the several planned webinars in seven global regions that will occur during this week. The webinar from Sub-Saharan Africa will highlight the DFOOT International theme for this year, Global Act Against Amputation, as part of ongoing to enhance awareness regarding uh, diabetic food complications. Subsequent webinars for remaining regions will run over the week with uh, main events are of International Working Group of Diabetic Food on 12th November, so don't miss it. And grand final and global meet would be on 13th November on Sunday. We, you are all welcome. Now, before I start my program, Professor Memuna has got some uh, commitments, so maybe I would uh, invite her to speak a few words before she leaves us. Prof okay. Professor Memuna. Thank you so much, Dr. Abbas, for this nice introduction and for giving me the opportunity to say some words. Um, I am presently in Abidjan because I'm acting as a judge member in a, the big city to become what we call agrégé de médecine in the, the French system. So, um, but I'm very happy to be here and to say some words because I'm, uh, I'm acting as the regional representative of DFOOD for West Africa, particularly the French speaking countries. And I'm very proud of this initiative of DFOOD International, the Diabetic uh, Food Awareness Week, because we all know the high incidence of lower limb amputations, which is even higher in our African countries compared to the developed countries. So these uh, awareness weeks, uh, and today we will talk about the lower limb amputations, and this gives us an opportunity to deliver additional education related to diabetic food, and uh, particularly the, the importance of uh, early detection and proper management. So I'm very happy that our, our, our representatives, our members in Africa will benefit from this session and that they are all here participating massively and that this will help to improve region. Thank you very much, Abbas. I wish you to have a nice session. Happy to share the minutes later to we'll, we'll talk about that could be available later on. Thank you very much, Abbas. Thank you very much for giving this time. Thank you, Vamuna. You can go and come, go and finish your job. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye, Felix. Bye, everyone. Okay, so we continue now. Uh, we have a speakers, seven speakers from Africa, and I'm proud that all of them from our continent, we all welcome them. Now, I, I have a privilege to inter, introducing the president of DFOOT International, Dr. Vijay Vishwana, who will, who, who will deliver his one, one, one and a half minute recorded uh, message to us uh, as it is almost past midnight in Africa, uh, in India. So can we have a video? My name is Dr. Vijay Vishwanathan, the president of DFOOT International based in Belgium. On behalf of the board of DFOOT International, I would like to welcome all of you to this
flagship project of DFOOT International, which is the Diabetic Foot Awareness Week 2022. I would like to thank the regional council members and the board members for making this successful each year from 2020 onwards. We have seven regions of the, of the DFOOT International with the Saka region, NAC region, Africa, MENA region, Southeast Asia region, and Western Pacific region. And we have allocated one day for each region from November 7th to November 14th, 2022. I hope this program will be useful to you and will enrich your knowledge about preventive diabetic foot care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vijay. Okay, we straight go and start with the uh, first speaker, Professor Felicia Anuma. He is a consultant physician from Nigeria. She's a professor of medicine, endocrinology, University of Abuja, Nigeria, honorary consultant, University of Abuja Teaching Hospital. She is a member of governing board of University of Abuja Teaching Hospital and a member of faculty board Emergency Medicine National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria. She's a member of Technical Working Group of Non-Communicable Disease Nigeria, Commissioner of NCD and Poverty Commissioner Nigeria, member of Planning Implementation Committee, and many more. She's also Editor-in-Chief in Africa Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism. She's a President of Diabetic Food Nigeria, Board Member of Pan-African Diabetic Food Study Group, and a Nigerian representative of DFOOT International. Today, she's going to talk on role of nurses in diabetic food prevention, and I have added in Africa. Welcome, Felicia. Thank you very much, Dr. Abbas, for the nice introduction. So can I share my slide? I want to yeah. thank uh, you for asking me to do this presentation in this program, one week program for you know, uh, creating awareness on diabetes food. So I will share, uh, sorry, share my slide. Can, can you see it? Can you see the slide? We can't see it, Felicia. Okay. Share screen. Okay. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You clear. can see the slide. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm talking about the role of nurses in diabetic food prevention. What is nursing? Nursing encompasses autonomous and collaborative care of individuals of all ages, families, groups, and communities, sick or well, and in all settings. It includes the promotion of health, the prevention of illness, and the care of ill, disabled, and dying people. They work on the front lines of disease prevention and the delivery of primary health care, including promotion, prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation. In many countries, nurses make up half, about half of all healthcare professionals. So reasons for the presence of nurses in healthcare team, the goals are that you know, they are there for health promotion, for prevention of disease, patient care, patient's compliance, improved physical, emotional, mental, sociocultural, and spiritual needs of the patient. So what, what do patients want from healthcare providers? Patients want healthcare providers to be good communicators, good at listening to them, good at explaining things to them, using plain everyday language and having a good bedside manner. Now, we, we have shifted our model of care from the doctor-centered care to patient-centered care. So we also have new model of education and interprofessional collaborative team. So we are proactive. We want to be proactive in prevention rather than reactive to the disabilities incurred as a result of diabetes complication. 
Now, we want to promote interprofessional education in the first instance, and that is what we are doing in this program, for example. And then education for patients with diabetes in the 21st century has evolved from limited general knowledge to clinical outcomes that encourage behavior change. From the simple distribution of information to patient-centered care education. Of course, uh, diabetes care is a multidisciplinary team care, and we can see, you know, the number of specialties involved in, you know, quality diabetes care. And of course, the nurse has a strategic role to play in this multidisciplinary team care. Now, ge for general diabetes education and counseling, it involves educating the patient on health promotion, physical activity, nutrition, treatment adherence, self-monitoring of blood glucose, correct wrong myths and misconceptions about that. Particularly in Africa, we have a lot of you know, myths and misconceptions about what diabetes is and how it should be treated. So coping strategies for adverse effects like hypoglycemia, food care education, and then psychological counseling and support. All these we need. And of course, we also need to prevent you know, complications from coming. Now, what is food care? Food care involves, you know, all aspects of preventive and corrective care of the foot and the ankle. And what's the purpose of food care? To maintain mobility and function of the foot, to prevent injury of the foot, to prevent ulcers, to promote early healing of the of foot injury, to prevent infection and save the foot from amputation. So various studies have shown that the following are important in protecting the feet from complications. Simple education, using simple language, care, motivation, action by persons with diabetes themselves. So the role of nurses in DM food prevention, they educate the patient on food care after they are empowered to do so, involves the family, the healthcare team, support groups, and religion organizations. Screening to identify early food problems, ensure patient complies with cell food care, prevention of complications, and skillfully identifying the affected needs and refer cases where necessary early. Educating patients on the importance of follow-up visits and compliance with care, evaluating patients' perception and understanding on self-care, home care for those limit who have limited vision and you know multiple comorbidities documenting care and communicating with other healthcare providers for the enhancement of care now diabetes food care and hygiene involves of course instructions on daily food care and daily inspection care of the nails you know the shoes socks first aid the dons and travel instructions care of calluses and cones. Now, this is an example of, you know, our diabetes uh, food uh, education session in our own teaching hospital being carried out by the diabetes nurse. Now, I want to present this case. Mrs. K is a 40 year old with diabetes for 12 years, obese, enjoys all her meals equally and really takes vegetables and fruits. She's a public servant that sits in her office most of the day. She also enjoys watching TV after dinner. She checks her blood sugar only on her clinic appointment days. Sometimes forgets to take her medications as prescribed. Abnormal, has abnormal sensations in her lower limbs. They never had food care education. What are the challenges with Mrs. K? She has dietary problems. She has a dentary lifestyle. She irregular blood sugar checks, poor glycemic control, poor drug compliance, diabetes complications, and has, has had no food care education. What's the role of the nurse in the care of Mrs. K? The nurse will assess, identify the problems, the knowledge gap, like in diet, exercise, drug compliance, and self-monitoring of blood glucose, plans diabetes education and counseling sessions with her, the nurse will provide food care education, together set the smart lifestyle modification goals, guide Mrs. K through implementation of modified lifestyle activities, provide psychological support and evaluates outcome and reassesses the patient. Now the nurses also have a role in wound care. 
You know, when our patients come with these terrible wounds, in fact, there are some of our colleagues who don't belong to the endocrine unit that run away, you know, because of the stench coming from wounds like this. But of course, the nurses, you know, with uh, the support of the doctors, painstakingly keep dressing these wounds. And particularly in Africa, where we don't want to lose any part of our body, because in Africa we have that meat that we must not return to our ancestors with any part of our body cut. So our patients are ready to stay in hospital for months, even six months, if only they can go back home, even with a deformed foot. So these are the, the, the kind of you know, state in which some of our patients come. And we keep dressing and dressing with the support of the nurses until you know, the wound uh, uh, heals. This is an example of our nurses you know, actively uh, dressing the wound uh, of this uh, patient. Um, in 2019, we had a training on wound care for about 22 nurses from about 20 government healthcare facilities in Abuja. So this is just a picture of what we did. And we had a faculty from the US who came to train them on wound care. Now, I want us to be aware that as little as this injury is seen, it, if not handled properly, can result in gangrene and amputation of this limb. In the University of Abuja Teaching Hospital, we have a multidisciplinary diabetes food group consisting of the endocrinologist, the nurse, the plastic surgeon, orthopedic surgeon, microbiologist, radiologist, pharmacist, the orthotist, the psychologist, and the physiotherapist. So we have a group in the teaching hospital. And this is just some of the members of the group. Now, our patients feel let down by healthcare professionals for lack of early food care education. And therefore, we can't overemphasize that we must educate these patients, we must educate them, we must educate them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Felicia. That was wonderful, really. And uh, uh, we'll come later on discussion. I am going to, I have few, uh, already started thinking about it and I'll ask other people even, that's really wonderful, very nice. Okay, we Thank go you. to, uh, welcome. We go to the second speaker, Dr. Hardeep Gill. He's a consultant vascular and endovascular surgeon from Kenya. He graduated from University of Nairobi and he proceeded to do his uh, uh, community service in district hospital 2005 and 2006. He became a general surgeon in South Africa at the University of Cape Town, where he graduated in 2011. And thereafter, he proceeded with his subspecialty in vascular surgery from the University of Cape Town in 2012 to 14. He works in private practice in Nairobi at two hospitals, NP Shah Hospital and Aga Khan Hospital. Today's topic is now we are from physician, we are going to the surgeon, role of vascular mm -hmm. surgeon in diabetic foot. Welcome, Dr. Abhi. Oh, sorry, sorry, I think I was muted. Thank you very much, Dr. Bass, for the kind introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, um, I'm very happy to be a part of this uh, meeting today. Uh, my topic today is just about uh, my role as a vascular surgeon in management of uh, diabetic foot problems. So patients who have got diabetes experience both large vessel peripheral vessel disease as well as microcirculatory changes. So in those presenting with foot sepsis, ulceration, necrosis or bony disintegration, a detailed vascular assessment is a clinical priority. Those with normal circulation can undergo local surgical debridement or bony stabilization, but those who've got compromised circulation may require revascularization if tissue necrosis or amputation is to be avoided. In such group of patients, just debridement alone and skin grafting and bony stabilization will not help unless you uh, revascularize um, the already occluded or stenotic blood vessels. 
So it's important not to rely on just a single finding such as a Doppler pressure. Uh, this may be misleading because patients who are diabetic have got uh, calcified vessels, the tunica media, they get medial calcinosis as a result of which when you do the ankle brachial index, you find that their ABI is actually very high. It's actually more than 1.0. And that's actually erroneous uh, because they've actually got some element of critical ischemia but the Doppler pressure does not correlate with that. So in the history, we have to look at a detailed assessment of any pain or inappropriate lack of pain from neuropathy. So patients who've got neuropathy may not feel the ischemic foot pain. And uh, pain due to neuropathy usually has a constant element and may be described as burning in character, whereas pain due to vascular disease typically affects the calf and foot and comes on after walking some distance without pain. And that's what we call intermittent claudication. So this pain, it's relieved by rest and it's reproducible. And that is an, a, a cornerstone of what vascular pain actually is. Ischemic pain or ischemic rest pain may be continuous or occurs only at night when the foot is elevated. Typically, the patient finds that hanging the foot off uh, down the bed reduces the pain, and that's because gravity assists in uh, filling up the, the vessels. So these patients should always be asked about the following risk factors for vascular disease, the duration of diabetes and the degree of diabetic control. So if the duration of diabetes has been long, like over 20 years, they're definitely going to have an element of severe vascular disease their diabetic control. How is their HbA1c? Is it less than 7%? Is it more than 7%? Are they smokers? Do they have a family history of vascular disease? Do they have hyperlipidemia? And assess for other symptoms of vascular disease or a history of uh, vascular disease in other uh, vascular beds. For example, the cerebral bed, have they had an, a history of uh, transit ischemic attacks, strokes, uh, any problem with their coronary circulation? which would present as angina or myocardial infarctions. And this uh, indicates the presence of already established vascular disease. On cl clinical examination, the inspection of the leg should be meticulous. So you shouldn't just only remove the, the shoe and socks and have a look at the foot. You have to look at the entire leg. So all clothing, both socks should be removed. The heels and interdigital cleft should be particularly examined for any evidence of necrosis, ulceration, or pus. Mm. Then elevate the foot. See what happens to the color of the foot. So a severely ischemic foot will turn from pink to white. <laughs> and when you let it hang, it then becomes very red. And that's called a positive burger sign. So it's pallor on elevation and rubber on dependency. What the moment you see that, that is a sign of uh, severe ischemia. And that's basically what it is. If you look at the foot on the right side, that's, that's turned pale. The one on the left side is normal. Similar thing on the right foot over there. And uh, when the foot is put in the dependent position, it becomes very red, ruber. So this redness can be misleading and we, you may think that actually there's enough sufficient blood supply, but that's just from the autonomic uh, dysregulation of the circulation, the autonomic neuropathy as well that causes vasodilatation of these capillary beds. So examination should include all the pulses. The presence of foot pulses indicate that the patient has a good peripheral circulation. So if all the foot pulses are present, there are three foot pulses, the salis pedis, the posterior bill, and the peroneal, if all three are present, then you've got good circulation. If one is missing, it's okay. You've got reasonably good circulation. So when foot pulses are absent, you have to know the pattern of vascular disease. So if you have a weak femoral pulse with pulses that are absent below it. So that's an aortoiliac disease. If you have strong femoral pulses, absent or weak popliteal pulses, that segment is a femoral popliteal segment. So you've got fempop disease. Usually these patients are amenable to uh, angioplasty or bypass. When you have normal femoral pulses, normal popliteal pulses, but absent foot pulses, that's tibia perennial disease. And that's the commonest pattern that we see with uh, diabetic patients. It indicates that disease is confined mainly to the tibial vessels and 
it's pretty much more complex to deal with uh, by angioplasty or with bypass surgery. So this is just examination of the pulses, so femoral pulses, popliteal pulses, posterior tibial pulses, dorsalis pedis pulses. So those pulses have to be checked. Now, in diabetic uh, feet, we get ulcers of different types. One thing that's very important to know is that are these ulcers, what's the uh, assessment and origin uh, of these ulcers? Are they venous? Are they arterial? Are they neuropathic? Are they traumatic? Are they malignant? So we look at the site, the size and shape, the margin, the edge, the floor. So in a venous ulcer, for example, in this picture, the, they are usually located on the medial malleolar area. They are very large. Uh, they're usually shallow, they're irregular, and the edges are like sloping down and the floor is full of granulation tissue and sometimes slough. Now, arterial ulcers usually occur on the lateral malleolus or on the finger, on, on the toes and uh, metatarsal heads. They're usually small, they're deep, they're irregular, they are sloughy and necrotic. They don't really have any granulation tissue. Neuropathic ulcers occur on pressure areas, for example, the metatarsal heads or on the heel and their shape is variable. The margins are, could be irregular, but it's like a punched out ulcer. Traumatic, will, there'll be a history of trauma and it all depends on uh, where exactly the trauma is located. Malignant ulcers will have rolled out ulcer, uh, edges, um, features that, uh, and even a history of chronicity. Now, this is a slide I borrowed from the DFoot International. So how do you classify diabetic foot infection? So it's mild, moderate, and severe. And there are different uh, characteristics that we look at. So for example, in this picture, so this would be classified as a mild infection. So there's local swelling and in duration, erythema of probably just five millimeters or less than a centimeter that you can see. There's localized tenderness or pain, local warmth, and maybe a little bit of purulent discharge may or may not be there. Now for the moderate ones, you'll have actually erythema that's spreading more than two centimeters. There'll be involvement of structures that are deeper than the skin and the subcutaneous tissues. There'll be no signs of any systemic inflammatory response. With the severe ones, you'll have all the features of uh, systemic inflammatory response where you are pyrexial, tachycardic, tachypnic with a white cell count that's very high or very, very low. So treatment of all of this will depend. So you're gonna use antibiotics for the mild infections. You can use um, oral agents for the modern infections, you can uh, decide oral and then or go to parental agents, but with the severe ones, of course, you will need uh, the parental antibiotics. So there are different classification systems for diabetic foot ulcers. There's a Wagner classification, University of Texas classification, the PDS classification, which is the perfusion, extent, depth, infection, sensation, uh, and then the Sinbad classification. So these are the different classifications, but the commonest one that we use is uh, the Wagner's classification. So that goes from uh, zero to five. Uh, zero is just uh, a patient who has a foot at risk. There's intact skin, but the foot is at risk. They are prone. You can see that they've already got autonomic neuropathy and they're going to get a wound anytime. Um, one is when you have superficial ulcers, two is when you have exposed tendons and deeper structures. The moment you have involvement of bone or uh, abscesses, you are number three. Minor gangrene will be stage four and um, extensive gangrenous tissue would be um, grade five. So this is basically how it looks like. So foot at risk, then uh, just minor subcutaneous tissue involvement, a deep ulcer, uh, this is involvement of bone and uh, presence of pus, then partial gangrene and gangrene of the whole foot. And this is basically how anything that is Wagner's three, four or five would look like. So how do we go ahead and investigate this patient? So once you've checked your pulses, you've seen the foot, how it looks like, Doppler studies to look at an ankle brachial index. So if you've got a septic foot, the whole foot is septic, there's no point of doing this. But if you've got uh, up to Wagner's three, then go ahead and do an ankle brachial index. So it's a, it's a special cuff um, and it's got a blood pressure cuff and a handheld Doppler. So we don't use a blood pressure machine to do an ankle brachial index. It's a, it's a handheld Doppler machine that already has its own blood pressure cuff and a Doppler probe. So you put the probe and on the foot and you take the highest pressure of the arteries, whether it's the dorsalis pedis or the posterior tibial or the perineal, 
and then divide it with the highest brachial, left or right brachial, and you get an index. So the normal index is more than 0 0.9 to 1. So if you have an index of less than 0 0.9, you have peripheral arterial disease. And if you have an index of less than 0 0.4, then you have severe peripheral arterial disease presenting with rest pain and gangrene. And in between, you're in the intermittent claudication range. So if you look at this, so your normal range is going to be about 0 0.9. Some studies go up to 1.1. 1 1.3 1 is probably on the higher side. But if you get an index of more than, say, 1.1 or 1.3, these are poorly compressible vessels. They are calcified vessels from the medial calcinosis that occurs in diabetic patients. 0 0.6 to 0 0.9, there's mild arterial obstruction. 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, there'll be moderate obstruction. And less than 0 0.4, there is severe obstruction. And these patients will have breast pain or an element of an ulcer or tissue loss in form of a gangrene. There onwards, you do a Doppler ultrasound arterial mapping. So uh, arterial mapping would look at the, the vessel itself, uh, its peak systolic velocity. And uh, if there's a stenosis, the peak systolic velocity will go up. Then you do use that velocity and divide by the normal velocity that you had before the stenosis. And you see, do you have a ratio of two, more than two? If you have a ratio of two, you have a stenosis of at least 50%. If you have a ratio of three or four, you have a, a stenosis of over 70%. That is followed by a CT angiography where you uh, intravenous dye is injected. So that's your uh, Visipec or Ultravis, depending on what's available. And you actually have a look at the entire circulation that you are, is of interest. So for example, in this, it's a lower limb angiogram and it gives an accurate road map of the vascular tree. Now a Doppler ultrasound cannot give you this much accuracy here. You can see heavily calcified vessels, areas of stenosis, areas of occlusions. And if you want to treat a vascular patient, you have to have a CT angiogram as long as your renal function is normal or else you could go for an MR angiogram. Now, invasive angiography is done in a special theater called catheterization lab, so the cat lab. So it's got an extra machine like that and a table that moves and uh, it's a radio lucent table so that you can uh, see what exactly you're doing. So you puncture the artery and commonly we do it at the common femoral artery at the level of the hip joint with the needle and then we inject dye. But invasive angiography should not just be used for diagnostic purposes. It's done for intention to treat. So you have a CT angiogram that can tell you what's happening then you do this invasive angiography with an intention to treat. Now we're gonna go in and we are gonna do an angioplasty stenting, or maybe it's not amenable to that and you go straight for bypass. These are some of the pictures you would see on a um, angiography, invasive angiography. That's a normal common femoral artery, profunda superficial femoral artery. That's a renal angiogram. That's a carotid angiogram showing stenosis in the carotid artery. But looking down over here, this is, the tibial angiogram. So there's stenosis that's there in the anterior tibial artery, uh, stenosis in the distal SFA, superficial femoral artery. So those are some of the things that we can see. So how do you treat these lesions? So if lesions are amenable to uh, so smaller lesions, we have got a task classification that goes from A, B, C, and D. I won't go into the details of that. But if you've got short lesions, they are amenable to angioplasty and stenting. Longer lesions, you, yes, you can try. But like extremely long lesions, those ones would require a, a bypass. So with an angioplasty, if that is the plaque, you try your best and cross it with a wire. Once you've done that, then you put a balloon, stretch it, and see what happens. If there's no recoil or no other complication, you may leave it as that. However, if there is recoil, then you may need to keep that vessel open with a stent. So similar thing, you puncture the femoral artery and you do the angiogram and you continue doing the dilatations. For example, this is a patient who's got a superficial ulcer on the dorsum of the foot. Invasive angiography shows disease. All three vessels are diseased. There. And with multiple areas of high-grade stenosis, what we call a beaded appearance, and then after angioplasty, you can see that there's good flow of blood into the anterior tibial artery and a partial reconstruction of the arch. So this is the patient's head gangrene of all the toes. So for such a patient, if you want to save the foot, the only functional amputation would be a transmetatarsal amputation, which is what you can see on the right side. And that heals over two to three months. But before that, you need to actually revascularize this patient. So this is what he had. So very diseased 
superficial femoral artery uh, and occluded uh, distal superficial femoral artery. Wire goes through the lesion and then sequential angioplasty is being done with the balloon. And you can see the waist that's over there. That's the balloon stretching up till it opens up completely. And that continues all the way to the popliteal artery and all the way down into the tibial vessels till finally you've got flow into the foot. This is an example of a patient who requires an aliac angioplasty. So high grade stenosis and a moderate grade stenosis. So that's a balloon angioplasty. And to keep it open, we had put a stent over there. Patient who had only gangrene of uh, one of the toes and uh, amputation of the fourth and the fifth as well done because it was, there was involvement of it uh, intra-op. Uh, an angiogram that showed that there's an area of uh, stenosis, angioplasty done. So once we do all these things, how do we define our success? So success is, is defined in different ways. Clinical response, technical success, technical failure, hemodynamic success. So in clinical response, we're looking at resolution of symptoms, limb salvage, and patient survival. Technical success, less than 30% recoil after the angioplasty. And flow to the pedal arch is very important. You need to have uh, velocities, okay, leave those velocities alone. And an improvement of an ABI of 0 0.1 to 0 0.15. So if you started off with an ABI of 0 0.4 and you went to 0 0.6, you have done very well. Technical failure would be failure to revascularize the target uh, vascular lesion and hemodynamic success. There are some uh, measurements over there which we don't need to really go into. So we also look at primary patency. So you open a lesion and it remains open, that's primary patency. You open a lesion and a few months down the line, uh, ultrasound shows that there is a stenosis that's developing, but before it occludes, you go in again and dilate it, that's called assisted primary patency. Secondary patency is once you have done the primary pr procedure, you did not uh, try to save or salvage any stenosis that was developing and you got an occlusion and then you finally open up that occlusion that's called secondary patency. Now, if you revascularize the area, the vessel that was of interest, for example, in the tibial arteries, the, the biggest artery is your uh, posterior tibial artery. If you revascularize that, that was your intention, then that's called target lesion revascularization. So if you if, uh, actually um, revascularize that because of its angiosomic distribution, then you've done a good job. Okay, uh, there are other factors of determinants of outcomes for endovascular treatment. For example, how is the lesion? Is it a proximal lesion? Is it a distal lesion? Is it a stenosis? Is it an occlusion? Is it a short lesion? Is it a long lesion? Is it a focal stenosis or are there multiple stenosis? So that characteristics of the disease. Pattern of vascular disease. Is it single vessel disease? Multi-level disease? Is it three vessel runoff, what is the best? Or is there poor runoff, less than three? Patient demographics, gender and comorbid disease. Clinical presentation is very important. Are they just claudicans or are they people who've got ulcers and gangrene, what we call critical limb ischemia and intra-procedural factors? Uh, did you have a stenosis, resi residual stenosis? Did you get a dissection or what happened? So these are some of the factors we look at when we see, how, is this patient actually gonna get success from this treatment or not? This is another example with an area of uh, high-grade stenosis in the popliteal artery, angioplasty being done, and you can see there is wasting of the balloon. Uh, finally, everything is open. And one thing that is very important in angioplasty is that there has to be flow to the pedal arch. If you do everything possible and you have flow up to the ankle joint here and nothing going to the foot, you're not gonna save that foot. Okay, uh, people may ask, how, what's the treatment outcomes and how successful are these uh, procedures? So the initial success rate is over 95%, almost 100%. Uh, your limb salvage rate, if it's only, you're treating the femoral popliteal segment, the segment between your hip joint and your knee, your overall limb salvage is pretty high. Your three-year patencies are like 60, 70% for claudicans. For critical limb ischemia, they're less than 50%. Now, if you compare angioplasty and stenting, uh, is there, is there any benefit? Should you just stent everyone or should you do angioplasty and then have a look and see, uh, should we secondarily stent? So this pink one is the angioplasty and the brown one is stenting. And your restenosis rate will always be higher with the angioplasty one uh, compared to the stenting. So actually you will see that uh, stenting demonstrated significantly diminished rates of restenosis. We stent, but we stent 
if it's required. Uh, if you look at the outcomes, the stamping outcome is definitely much better. Now, it depends in which group, claudicans or people who've got leg ulcers or gangrene. So if you're looking at, at claudicans only, angioplasty and stenting is almost the same. If you are looking at uh, patients who've got um, um, occlusions, uh, critical limb ischemia, then stenting group does a lot better than your um, uh, angioplasty group. Now, you know, these are plain balloons. Now we have got different balloons called DEBs, drug eluting balloons, or DCBs, drug coated balloons. The drug of interest is paclitaxel. So it's like packed onto the balloon. So when you go and de deliver angioplasty, the drug is delivered into the blood vessel, into the tunica media. So the reason for that is that it reduces the re-stenosis rates. And it's been shown in all these different studies that are there. We don't have to go through them, but if you just look at that graph over there, that whatever it is, um, angioplasty with a drug eluting balloon is much, much better than angioplasty with a plain balloon. Now, if you look at late lumen loss, so if you use a coated balloon versus a plain balloon, will you who will lose the lumen faster? And the lumen will be lost faster in the plain balloon. So the drug eluting balloon, there'll be less uh, late lumen loss. Now, if you look at target lesion revascularization, definitely much benefit with a drug eluting balloon. As you can see that this diamond over here favors drug eluting balloons on both studies. Okay. Now, what about major amputations? So if you use a drug eluting balloon or a plain balloon, are you saying that we'll not get amputations? We will get amputations because it depends on the state of the foot and the sepsis in it. So that's why once this touches the this diamond, touches the middle of this line over here, there's actually, it's not statistically significant. So you can't say I use a drug eluting balloon, I shouldn't get an amputation. So if you look at drug eluting stent versus drug coated balloons for revascularization, there isn't much of a difference. It's almost the same. You'll probably see the difference very later on in life. So treatment outcomes, what about if we do a bypass and uh, compare it to angioplasty? Which one is better? So there was a trial called the Basil trial, and this one was basically a bypass versus angioplasty for severe ischemia of the limb. So basically, if you look at two years, there's no difference in amputation-free survival. Uh, patients who are very frail, their life expectancy is actually less than two years. You would rather give them angioplasty because it's minimally invasive. And if they've got a good life expectancy of more than two years, then you would give them bypass surgery. Now, treatment outcomes for angioplasty below the knee, the intrapalpital angioplasty, they've got a very good technical success rate, uh, two-year limb salvage rate, uh, almost 60 to 70 percent, and two-year freedom from critical limb ischemia, 60 to 70 percent. Now, there are some technical failures that you can get. You can get dissection, stenosis, you can occlude the vessel while you're doing the procedure, you can throw a thrombus down and cause dyslambolization, and late failure happens because of smooth muscle growth. And to reduce that smooth muscle growth is when drug eluting or drug coated balloons actually help. Surveillance, how do we follow up these patients? You do, uh, you do a clinical examination, ankle brachial indexes and duplex ultrasounds. And if you find any problem, do a CT scan, of course, risk factor modification, diabetes, hypertension, cholesterols, and smoking cessation, your antiplatelet therapy and your statins. Now those are, uh, interventional procedures. What about surgical revascularizations? Yes, we do them. This is an AOTO bifem bypass graft. This is a femoral popliteal bypass graft because this lesion is very long. This is an axillo bifemoral graft because we could not do an AOTO bifem on this patient who had very poor cardiac uh, ejection fraction. And this is a femoral femoral bypass graft. We won't go into the details of all of this. Now, what happens now if you don't treat these patients, then of course you end up with amputations, either an above knee amputation or a below knee amputation. So in conclusion, I don't know where the slide's gone, but in conclusion, so assessment of the vascular status of the diabetic foot relies heavily upon a careful history taking and a meticulous clinical examination. And when supplemented with handheld Doppler pressure measurements, this should allow the clinician to decide whether the patient has evidence of significant vascular disease. If that is there, then of course, uh, go ahead, do your uh, CT angiogram and go ahead and do your debridement for ulcerations, necrosis, and sepsis. And more complex evaluation may be required in these cases to clarify the extent of vessel involvement and the potential for treatment. 
So angioplasty and stamping as well as surgical bypasses are regularly performed in our setup. And that is something that we should take up and try as much as possible to save these diabetic feet. Just debridement alone is not going to help. You have to increase blood flow or revascularize the area that you want to deprive and create a new wound from. So with that little, thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hadi. Uh, that was a fantastic overview. And uh, even as a physician, I could understand that. And we needed it because now diabetic foot is becoming a baby for surgeon. Thank you very much. The, the discussion will be later on. Okay. Thank you. Coming to the, yeah. Coming to the third speaker, Dr. Shiri Bonani, a podiatrist from South Africa. She's a qualified podiatrist with over 13 years of experience. <clears throat> She's currently working in a public sector as well as a private sector where she tirelessly focused on studying the limbs. And she has served as a wound care committee at Chris Henny Baragwant Hospital where she also served on advisory board this includes serving on advisory board for healthcare companies. She's also still involved in continuous educations for podiatrists and other professionals in wound care, currently uh, in the trends in diabetic food management. Her topic for today is a role of podiatry in Africa in the management of diabetic foot ulcers. So we started with nurses, we went to surgeons, and now we're coming to podiatrists. Welcome, Dr. Mbonan. <clears throat> You are muted. I'm muting, I'm muting myself. Uh, thank you so much for, for a beautiful introduction, Dr. Abbas. I'm going to try and, and be as gracious as my, my previous two um, speakers because I will be repeating some of the things that they have said. Um, so we cannot um, talk about diabetic foot ulcers without um, looking at what it is and how, what are the challenges in Africa. And uh, it, by the time we get to 2040, we're looking at just over um, 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 a number of in the hundred millions. And with an increase in the disease burden, we find that there will be an increase in the presentation of complications such as diabetic foot ulcers. Um, and I mean, if seven out of 10 adults are undiagnosed, some are actually admitted um, with, a, with a diabetic foot ulcer and they only then realize or are diagnosed um, in that instance. So it is important that we look back at why is this, um, we having this burden of disease and how can we, then looking at how, how, how much is increasing and how can we prevent diabetic foot uh, ulcers. Uh, our perspective is that with an increase in diabetic uh, diabetes mellitus di uh, diagnosis, there's an increase in diabetic foot presentations because this is one of the complications that generally pre presents commonly. We also need to consider that um, when we're looking at the prevalence, it's progressive. If we are unable to, to, to then prevent, it means we are missing the mark somewhere. And diabetes associated with urbanization, lifestyle changes, as well as the age population. In my unit where we've been doing uh, sunscreen, we actually found that um, the elderly are now coming in and are newly diagnosed with diabetes. We've also as, uh, realized and also found that the newly diagnosed patients that are, are increasing between the ages of about 35 and 45, which is also a concern because some of them have presented with diabetic foot complications. Now, diabetic foot um, complications, we, we need to consider that we, we are we need to consider that they present simply because of a couple of, of factors. And one of those is that access. Not a lot of people, especially in an African continent, have access to a, a podiatrist. They do not get their feet assessed. They do not get necessary services. There's one point that Dr. Felicia said is about education, where patients are not 
they don't have the knowledge, they can't implement the knowledge, therefore it seems they do not understand what is happening. Now, when we look at what is it that we can we can do for patients, we need to also remember that some patients present to our clinics very late. And this can be due to its multifactorial. Some are in denial that they're diabetic, some are also um, trying to go to traditional healers for, for treatments, and some are also um, old, living alone, and therefore cannot take care of themselves. But one of the things that we've realized is distance. If a patient is staying far from a clinic, uh, the only time they get to have the money to come to the clinic, then they're able to come to the clinic. Our personal perspective then was, was looked at where between the, the year 2015 and 2017, we assessed from month to month, do we have an increase in diabetic um, uh, patients that are diagnosed? And we found that yes, it is. So the numbers have increased between those, those years. We wanted now to see what is the correlating factors. 60% of those patients were actually presenting with a hyperglycemia and 20% of those patients were newly diagnosed diabetics, and the numbers are actually quite high. Um, within these numbers, we do find about 5% or 10% of patients that are, it's, they are being readmitted, whether it's a hyperglycemia or DKA, and some a hypoglycemia. And these are the ones that we give um, continuous and reiterating the education. So glycemic control is a challenge. What we then did was we looked specifically for one month, which was September 2022, where we needed to see what is it that's presenting um, with our patients. And we realized that with the diabetics that we've seen, which is 116, um, um, which is 261, 116 were done a diabetic foot assessment. The one of the things that came out was that 52 of these patients presented with wounds and 47 presented with diabetic peripheral neuropathy and then 22 presented with peripheral vascular disease. So the com common etiology that's presenting with most of these patients is diabetic peripheral neuropathy. And when we question the patients and when we are interrogating and trying to find out how they, they got the, 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 the ulcer or they got hurt, we, we actually realized that some were trying to do surgical bathroom surgery at their own home, whether it's cutting cones and calluses, cutting their nails, um, removing uh, something from their feet and some have used caustics on their skins to remove hard skin and eventually then created a wound. The shocking part is the amputations that we have seen and this is what brought us to to fight and and to to work harder at empowering the patients so that they understand that they have to play a role in the prevention of diabetic foot ulcers and ultimately um, amputations. And with limb salvage uh, being our mantra and limb salvage being our main um, approach, we, we, we do find that at times patients, because they present late, they end up having um, amputations that ultimately force them to, to, to where we can't even save. So with these uh, patients that we saw, um, 13 of them had ray amputation eight had transmit and uh, Dr. Jill was correct. One of the other functional ways of making sure the patient will be able to be functional is to do a TMA. But what was concerning for us is the amount of BKAs we saw. And the common denominator was that there was foot sepsis and there was nothing that can be done. And the amputations are a problem because then uh, we find that the system gets to be inundated from life-changing event of just an ulcer and eventually to a, a whole turn up of someone's life. So diabetic foot ulcers are altering events and it's a frequent com uh, uh, complication. And as you can see with this picture where this dog is sitting and thinking it's fine. Our patients find ourselves sitting just like that. Um, it is quite 
traumatic for them and it's also quite confusing because they see these things happening that they did not actually expect, but they are happening. Peripheral uh, neuropathy plays a big, big role. Micro and macro angiopathy as well plays a, a, a big role. That is why we then go back to um, what kind of an ulcer are you seeing? Is it neuro ischemic? Is it ischemic? Or is it just an external force pressure related? And we find that most patients that present with diabetic foot ulcers have got some part of peripheral neuropathy. It's a financial burden. Now, patients from a socioeconomic, they also, you find that then they lose their jobs or they can't go to work anymore. Um, obviously, recurrences of, um, of ulcers will cost money for the patient as well. So we're looking at um, hospital stays are caused by, by, by diabetic foot ulcers, prolonged hospital stays as well, hospital admissions as well. And we do need the finances to be able to service our patients just as much as the patient would need the finances to be able to attend to, to the clinics. Ultimately, diabetic foot ulcers do precipitate or do lead to um, lower extremity amputations. And this is what we would like and hope to prevent. Majority of these diabetic foot ulcers are preventable. Um, and this is where we know that we can teach the basic podiatric home care or foot care and patients, if they do comply or if they do adhere, then they will be able to notice whatever it is that might be a concern and they would present to us much quicker. So what is the role of a podiatry in the management of um, diabetic foot ulcers? The biggest one is prevention, prevention, prevention. And part of the prevention is being able to educate your patient, not just about the diet or understanding glycemic control, but also of just how to take care of themselves at home. Diabetic foot education, and I was quite chuffed when I saw um, a Dr. Felicia's picture because that's exactly what we do. You do a one-on-one -on -one session with patients or you can do a group session. Um, where you educate and you empower your patients so that they're able to implement it when they get, get home. One of the other preventative me um, measures or um, things that we can do is regular assessment. If a patient um, doesn't have any signs of any complication, you can see them once or twice a year, even if they do not have a problem. Generally, what we would say is, if we see that you have peripheral neuropathy, you have presented with some vascular component that is compromised, but and you've also had an amputation, you see us at least between two to three months, that assists us in making sure that we have a, a continuous monitoring of your foot, but also it keeps us in the loop as to what is happening. Then we look at diabetic foot disease, advanced wound care, which has become a bit bigger in, in the world now. So we are working at how best can we manage patients so that they we have um, wounds for less time. How best can we implement our knowledge from offloading devices to orthopedic devices so that we can heal the wound uh, much faster, but also improving the patient's quality of life. I cannot stress enough um, about MDT, you know, multidisciplinary care is, is, is quite important because we cannot function in silos. We function um, as a team and as a team, we are able to even um, not miss certain things. So that is one thing. Another one is we're looking at diabetic foot care checklist. And Dr. Jill men uh, mentioned it again, blood flow assessment is quite key. Uh, your clinical, when your clinical aspect of assessment is solid, the other advanced ones would be at adjunct, but they are also key in making sure you, you look at um, or you assess and you find if there is a problem. Regular assessments assist us to see if there's a change, monitor if there's a change, and if there is a change, we are able to then refer further to a vascular surgeon. Nerve function um, assessment as well. 
as much as we know there's peripheral neuropathy, there are patients that are present with a uh, motor component that is uh, compromised, where now their feet are, get, are getting weak, they can't stand for long, they can't walk for long, and in addition to the peripheral uh, neuropathy. And there are foot changes as well, and the foot changes then result in biomechanical changes. If foot morphology changes, then it means the redistribution of pressure under the foot also changes. Then the biomechanical aspect of it um, comes through where we assess what the foot does in normal and what changes can be done regarding that in terms of an orthotic or an insole or a change of footwear or modification of a shoe so that the patient can properly function. Reconstructive surgery. Um, with, with reconstructive surgery, you work very closely with your orthopedic surgeons, where we've got patients with charcot and we, we need assistance in terms of how can they in, in be involved in the reconstruction um, of the foot. And we, we have had um, successes where patients have presented with wounds due to the fact that the morphology of the foot has changed, there's collapse of the medial longitudinal arch and um, the drop diff navicular causes an ulcer and the reconstruction of the foot then assists in making certain that the wound closes as well. Multidisciplinary, very important. So we're going to look at a couple of case studies um, that we did and this looks more at how podiatry was involved at the beginning. And the first picture shows a lady who's had um, an abscess on the calcaneus and she was debrided. And the initial um, decision was that um, she was gonna do a BKA. And we had requested that, can we as podiatry be given an, uh, an opportunity to assist the lady? She, this is a 49 year old female, type two diabetic, uncontrolled glycemic. Glycemia, glycemic readings, and also um, she had now lost her job and she was at home most of the time. In her case, we used um, total contact casting, which is a fiberglass boot that is um, rewashable. You can rewash it, you can reapply it, um, and it gave us results in a short space of time, in about three months. We were, uh, we were already uh, at the close stages. And with her, she was obese, she had gained a lot of weight, and with the TCC, it gave us um, the correct offloading that we needed for her to heal a little bit faster. In her instance, in most of the cases that we've seen, especially in the public sector, what we would then do is we would then request for a temporary social um, grant. Um, patients need the money, like I said, to come to our clinic. So when we, when we apply for the temporary social grant, we are able to be assured that the patient will come because then she's got the money to come. Um, unlike if we're expecting her to come, but we are not assisting her in any way in order for her to come to our clinic. The next picture is of a gentleman who's had, um, this was a 61 year old uh, male patient, type two diabetic, um, and she, he was just wearing the wrong shoes. So external pressure resulted in a fifth ray amputation. And upon admission to have the ray amputation done, he then developed that abscess at the bottom. And it was uh, lanced um, on bedside. And the first picture, as you can see on your top left, that's the first time we have seen him and we decided we want to save his, his foot. Um, and the decision that was initially made was that a TMA were needed to be done. And we said, let's use advanced um, offloading techniques and advanced wound care, and let's see how we can assist them. And in a space of about two months, the bottom part of the foot was healed. And we also continued with managing the post-surgical wound of the first strain amputation. The third case study is of a 49-year-old male patient type one diabetic, but he had psoriatic arthritis. Um, and he also had normal calluses under the foot and he used some um, caustic on it and it resulted in a wound. He did um, um, continuously 
manage it at home until he then came through and we were able to assist him. We also used advanced dressings. He did have extend, extensive peripheral neuropathy. As you can see, the foot morphology has also changed. We also introduced an orthotic in, in his shoes post the, the, the post healing of the wound. And our final case is a 61 year old male patient uh, type 2 diabetic, a smoker and a drinker, and his occupation was a, me um, a motor mechanic. And when he came through, the hallux was gangrenous, and he then refused to have a TMA done. Um, and then he was sent to us to see what we can do with, with uh, the foot. And we, we used on him topical um, oxygen, where we wanted to speed up the healing. We did realize that the second toe was actually uh, cyanotic the first time around and, and became gangrenous and we let it auto amputate. Um, and if, as you can see at the, the bottom picture, he, he healed up in a short space of time as well. So the top, the advanced uh, wound care uh, modalities that we used were chosen based on the type of patient that we are having. And we're looking at how can we improve the patient's quality of life, but how can we make sure that we have wounds for less time? And all these med um, uh, modalities we chose, uh, we chose them with an end in mind, and the end was we would, uh, we would prefer for the wound to heal much faster. But it required adherence from the patient. So patient-centered care is key, where the patient is, becomes part of the choices that are being made for their health and the patient understands the pros and cons of whatever choice they will they will make so what is what is our take home our take home is that diabetic foot ulcers can be um, preventable we look at external forces that can cause um, diabetic foot ulcers, whether it's septic cons and calluses, the shoes that the patient wears, or whatever the patient might be doing on their feet. We also look at the multifactorial um, influences that can play a part, be it peripheral neuropathy, be it micro and macrovascular um, in involvement. So we, it's it's one of those things that allows us to 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 know that we can prevent it, right? Knowledge applied is power. Educating our patients allows them to have, to be mindful and to understand what choices they can make. And from a podiatry perspective, we, we need to continue doing that education and giving that education and empowering our, our patients. Um, because it is important that we understand what are the predictors of lower limb amputations and ultimately diabetic foot ulcers do lead to amputations if they are not um, managed timelessly. Regular podiatry foot assessment is important. It allows us to have a regular monitoring of what is happening with the foot. Management of predisposing factors just, uh, such as hyperkeratosis or necrocryptosis, um, offloading in peripheral neuropathy, neur neuropathic changes also allows us to prevent um, or to encourage redistribution of pressure on the foot, on the feet, and therefore preventing central areas of the foot having pressure. In a paper that was done by uh, Clark and Zubani in 2008, it's still the same we're still singing the same song where education is key, assessment is key, and what type of assessment is. And part of our assessment when it comes to, to neuropathy, we're looking at the vibration sensation where we use a 28 megahertz tuning fork, uh, cutaneous pressure where we're using a 10 gram monofilament. We also look at light and dull touch, the sensation of pain, and also the differentiation between cold and hot. We've had cases in, in winter where our patients have gotten burnt because they can't sense whether the water is too hot or not. And those cases, then we can see that peripheral neuropathy plays a huge role. There are patients who have presented with kidney disease and uh, because they, they are on dialysis, then we can see the effects of that on the feet. So assessment of such a patient, allowing us to work as a multidisciplinary, allows us to manage our patients much better. One of the biggest challenge we have is human resources. Um, in South Africa, we do have just over 40 uh, podiatrists, 
but they are only in one area. They're, most of them are in, um, in, in Johannesburg and they are in the public sector, but not necessarily in all the major hospitals. If we do a preventative measure, we're looking at the primary health care at the lowest level where education, where prevent, preventative measures can be implemented. However, we do not have a lot of podiatrists in those areas. In Lesotho, on its own, we only have two podiatrists. Uh, in Kenya, there's also about two or three podiatrists, if I'm not mistaken. And in Zim, in Zimbabwe, we also have two podiatrists. So Africa does need um, podiatrists podiatrists so that we are able to play a role in the prevention of amputations. Sadly or unfortunately, uh, only one institution in Africa uh, does give the course of podiatry and that's the University of Johannesburg. Um, but they are also doing their part in making sure that uh, we have podiatrists that can be uh, spread throughout. Multidisciplinary care, like I said, quite key and patient-centered care also very important. If you, you speak at them, they don't listen, but if you speak with them and you discuss with them, patients tend to understand better and they're able to adhere. Um, in a study that was done by one of my colleagues, Richard Masweta, who just recently came back to South Africa with uh, he, him and his team were looking at the outcomes for podiatry-led <laughs> tertiary service in Kuwait. And they have found that Though there might be a lot of factors that contribute to diabetic food ulcers, uh, there are outcomes that are positive uh, from a podiatry led tertiary service in Kuwait. We are the first line when it comes to food complications or food problems. And we are the first line in terms of prevention where we are able to assess our patients. And we are also able to, to place our patients where they need to in terms of referring to a vascular surgeon or referring to an orthopod or referring and, to, and having conversations between the diabetic educator or the diabetic nurse, including the diabetologist. So we kind of have, um, we are like the all-rounders of communicating with everyone involved in the multidisciplinary team. With all that being said, I'm hoping that we have all gotten something from the presentations. Um, I always think that I'm the one who is crazy enough to change the world. Um, and we inspire others to do the same, um, regardless of the numbers we have. With that said, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Shidi. Very, very nice. Really, it was a good overview of Podiatry's role in management of diabetic food ulcers. Uh, I agree with you. We have the education is the only tool we have it in Africa for prevention and it is free for free of charge for the patient if it is implemented effectively. So we need to work on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we go to next speaker uh, and I can see him. He's already here. Dr. Charlie Ilingo Bongo from Brazil. Brazilian Congo. He's a lecturer at the Department of Endocrinology and the Faculty of Health Science of the University of Brazil, Congo, since 2014. Head of Department of Endocrinology, Diabetology at General Hospital, and since 2010 and since 20, 2009, is a scientific advisor and a trainer of uh, uh, diabetes association with the project of decentralization of diabetes care in Congo. Today's topic is, is diabetic food, the Congolese experience. You are welcome, doctor. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for welcoming me, for inviting me to this talk. I'm very uh, pleased and I'm very grateful now for being here as an invited speaker. And you as my mentor and uh, Professor Maimuna too, I'm really, really happy to be here to share my experience and the long journey you took me through diabetic food in Africa. And now I'll talk about the Congolese experience. So let me share my, uh, I don't know how to do this. Okay. Is it good? So, uh, I want to talk about the Congolese experience of diabetic food. And uh, this is the agenda of my talk. 
So we all know that uh, diabetes, diabetes is the major public health problem. And uh, that diabetes food is the, the one of the worst complications that we do uh, worry and uh, we do avoid. So we know also that people with diabetes, 15% of them, there be uh, some of them suffering of diabetes food hardship. And uh, this is the cause of long duration of hospitalization. And in our settings, we cannot uh, estimate the, the, the financial uh, cost of uh, the hospitalization due to uh, diabetic, diabetic food. And uh, we know also that diabetic food is uh, one of the major cause of amputation. And uh, every 20 seconds, we know that we have an amputation due to diabetes food. And um, also the cause of this um, diabetic food are well known and can be prevented, 80% of them. So talking about diabetes in Congo, our data are some of very, very old now because the, the, the only one um, step survey we have, it was in 20, Four in Brazzaville, and that we found that diabetes in our population was about seven percent. And one study uh, was conducted in the hospital setting in Brazzaville. We found about fifteen percent of uh, uh, diabetic food. In my setting, in my city where I work, actually, I found eight point five, and we found also some factors like um, uh, peripheral vascular disease in some patients without. Uh, also, 40 percent when you use a, a, a anchor brachial index, or 25 percent when you use Doppler uh, ultrasound. And the neuropathy also is to to common. Yeah, 80, 84 percent with diabetic food have neuropathy. So how is uh, the management of diabetes organized in my country? We, we know that um, we have to build the to to take some stakeholders and policies in around the country through the Ministry of Health. At the level of this uh, uh, organization, the Ministry of Health in Congo, we have a national program. The national program, which include NCDs, but without any specificity, any specificity about diabetic food, nothing like this, but only it includes all non comical disease. But when we come to the hospital level, actually, I do remember when I came back, it was 14 years ago to my country, I was the fifth endocrinologist in the whole country, but actually we are almost, we are 14 endocrinologists in the whole country. They are distributed in two cities, the capital city and Point Noir, which is the second city of the country in six different hospitals. And then you can see the teaching hospital is the oldest hospital in the country. It has 12 beds dedicated to diabetic foods. That means uh, many, many cases of diabetic food admitted in this hospital are uh, really seen there for uh, uh, being occupying the beds in the, hosp in the hospitalization. The General Hospital Adolf Cisse in Point Noir, where I work since 2010, I have the total of 15 beds. And sometimes I can find out more than 50% of my beds are busy by diabetic food. And we have also some new um, practitioners in uh, new hospitals in, uh, in this city of Point Noir. We have also an active associative, associative initiatives, which uh, carries um, trainings, partnerships, and advocacy and awareness about diabetes in general and diabetic food also. And this association has uh, centers which various uh, diabetes activities, and some of them are really focused in diabetes food, uh, which was uh, uh, introduced with DIAFI, the Diabetes Africa uh, Food Initiative. This, with the association, we built um, a model of decentralized uh, diabetes care in Congo. Myself, I was, as you said, a trainer and adviser. So this, we built this um, model that take diabetes through all the centers, all peripheral centers in the country, connected to the specialized centers which are in Brazzaville and in Pointe Noire. So everywhere in these centers, we can screen diabetes and all its complications. And the, ten, the, the peripheral centers can refer to the reference hospital or to the central specialized in the teaching hospital of Brazzaville or Point Noir. This we built during 10 years with some partners 
partners like uh, uh, World Foundation and uh, other partners. So are all resources available in my country where we talk about team approach, where we talk about management of diabetic food? Actually, what we have, when you see any components of, tab, uh, of, of diabetic food, we have, we can do X-ray easily. We can do scanner or MRI, we can do culture. But some uh, screening tests are still not available like angiography, TCPO2 and uh, MRI angio or scintigraphy or maybe biopsy, tissue biopsy. This is for us a very difficult issue to, to good management, to put a good diagnosis and to manage this uh, type uh, the diabetic food. Uh, we, our journey to uh, management of diabetic food in the country started with uh, the, the, the challenge of building the teams. And that's, we uh, went through a skills acquisition like or through conferences, congresses, international congresses and trainings, uh, international workshops and webinars. And uh, so that we can uh, um, load international standards and recommendations through the country, which will help with diagnostic and treatment. So the diabetologist myself, I was, I started with my training in uh, 2009. And uh, I, I think you do remember it was in 2009 in Kinshasa when uh, we met the first time and um, I was even stolen the computer <laughs> during the training. So that was the beginning, the start beginning, but anyway, I didn't lose my help and I, I still continue. We got some training after that, the fifth joint ADA and ASD IDF in Tanzania. And then we went to education program with IDF, this, which, which we, we load also um, mm, mm, this uh, diabetic food uh, conversation map to make patients know about this uh, 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 the pro uh, problem of diabetic food, how to avoid, how to identify the simple factors, the simple answer, uh, how to, to, uh, to, to cut nails and everything through education. And then the um, Africa program, the Diabetic Food Africa Initiative was introduced in Africa by the year 2012, 2014. Congo also uh, was involved and, but it didn't go through the country. And I became the member of this Pan-African Diabetic Food Study with uh, um, the help of your youth mentors, uh, Professor Abbas and Maimuna. And also I was invited to Madrid 2018 when we launched uh, Deep Food International. And after that, we finished with the uh, Train the Food Trainer Africa in Marrakesh, that was to the Francophone side in Africa, uh, with um, the South Africa, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Congo, and uh, also some country from um, uh, Maghreb and Africa, like uh, Morocco, Tunisia, and Nigeria. The first uh, training I um, was uh, involved in, it was in 2009, as I told you. So that was the first initiative I really, really appreciated. And it was like a new hub in our settings because we developing country, we didn't have anything, but we got some experience from Tanzania. We, can't, we, could, we could know that without anything, without simple things, we can challenge, challenge with the big food. So with this training, with theoretical and practical aspect of management of diabetic food. We went through a week. It was a very good experience. When I came back to my country, I was already considered like, like a small expert in my teaching hospital where I was working. And then DFOOT International uh, in Madrid, when uh, we uh, were the first maybe to launch this organization with world, world experts. And the train the food trainer in Africa, in Marrakesh, where we're really trained with workshops uh, with this uh, international faculty, bo uh, faculty board members. So the challenges also concern our nurses. I could find a way how to train the nurses through this ADA, um, the sixth joint ADA is the IDF uh, postgraduate training in Addis Ababa, where I stand two nurses and they were really, really focused in diabetic food. And we organized some African uh, summit in Brazzaville here with workshop in, uh, uh, about diabetic food and some different trainings here with my, myself as a local expert. And then I decided because we in the French speaking um, word, we had um, a reference like uh, Dakar with Professor Maimuna 
they have a good, good experience. Uh, they work with some podiatrics from Belgium. So I just negotiated to send two nurses. Uh, there, was a, there was a workshop there and they stayed for two weeks of intensive training uh, uh, workshop there in Dakar. And actually two of these nurses are the main nurses working in the area of diabetic post, uh, 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 like uh, uh, the main resources in my, in my service here in Point Noir. So what globally is my team actually uh, in Point Noir where I work? The only one diabetologist in my hospital, that's the 12th year I'm working here with two nurses really trained and we uh, collaborate with orthopedic uh, surgeon. We have an infectious disease specialist who is not too much involved. I do remember sometime I called him for management or infection, infection to discuss. He usually say, this is not my stuff. So we just have to struggle ourselves with this diabetic, uh, diabetic food issues. We have not vascular surgeon in the Point Noir while they are in Brazzaville, but with limited technical platform. We don't have podiatrists. Uh, we have seen that some African countries in Sub-Saharan Africa for uploading are using shoemakers to create or to make some local experiences in Senegal and Cameroon, very, very um, positive issues we've seen, but we don't actually uh, have uh, not included them in our program till now. Because the thing is, after the uh, trend of food trainer, I was supposed to um, to carry a pilot experience with uh, by creating um, a center of diabetic food. We have identified partners. We have identified uh, uh, the building way to, to load the program. But with, um, how to call it, with uh, COVID-19, some of our partners just dropped the projects. So till now, it's just embryonic. So what the results, what we see actually in the, um, in our area. This the, the data from uh, 2001. This is the published uh, paper from Professor Manabeka. As you can see, this mechanical factor of like trauma or shoes or anything, they represent 32% of the cause of diabetic foot ulcers. And this infection was 64. But in the point now, the mechanical uh, factors like trauma, we have 50% of cases that the study I, I, I compared from 2018. And some uh, other factors like uh, burning or, uh, or bite of, of um, muscles and everything like 44 or 45 pences. So actually this, um, the items you can see that the delay before admission to the hospital is too, too long from one week to uh, one and a half months and the maximum is three months before coming to the hospital. The duration of hospitalization is like from one week to two months, the maximum is four months. And um, the amputation rate is too, too high. The study published in Brazil with 42 and uh, in point nine in 2018, it was 40. But I just analyzed the new data uh, for this uh, patient included with diabetic food in my, in my uh, service. The amputation was indicated in 41% cases. And we did 36 because the other part they refused or it was not done and some of them just died. And then you can see the mortality rate in my city actually just doubled in these three last months. And the infection of course is at the first line of, uh, of the, the one of the company of diabetic food also. One thing specific we can see is even if we are not doing the, maybe properly um, uh, the culture, but what we can see when we do, when we perform the culture, we find more gram negative uh, uh, microorganism than uh, the published uh, common like gram positive in point noir. And uh, common antibiotics, I know like amoxicillin or other eyes, we are find amipenem, amicacin, and every, every time that's the uh, antibiotic, antibiotics we see almost more than 50% of the cases. Um, the treatments, as I said, we start with the broad spectrum antibiotic, antibiotics covering gram positive and gram negative and with anaerobic, anaerobic sometimes when we feel that they are present. And then we do cultures, but actually we still limited with the swabs, which not actually recommended. We're supposed to use uh, 
the tissue or bone biopsies. And uh, since we were trained to that, I used to discuss with them the lab where we perform these uh, cultures, but they said they are not able to perform the, um, the culture with biopsy of tissue or bones in it. So we still continue with the, with the swab and we go deeply, we try to go deeply to have this culture. So that's a small, maybe not a small or a big bias of our uh, data actually to identify microbes over here. So predominantly, predominantly, as I said, it's gram negative and with these antibiotics, as you see. So this, um, the case we usually see, and uh, as you can see in the pictures, the way we manage these uh, uh, cases, this uh, really, really uh, uh, infected food, which was uh, really uh, good managed and it's really had with a, a good, uh, uh, it was, it, it healed totally. Uh, this also uh, I've just seen it recently and uh, it's been treated for two or three months already. He came with an infected food and with the surgeon, we just uh, removed this. He did a good debridement like this and actually we can see the way it ended. It was a really a uh, good result. Uh, with uh, some comp components of um, PVD, as you can see, this patient just underwent uh, amputation of uh, three tools and also the uh, 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 pro uh, prognosis was very good with the, the healing of the, the lesion. Here also, you can see the same thing. And this, like the way people come at admission, this peripheral disease, peripheral arterial disease, you can see. But anyway, this patient was too lucky, as you can see. We just, uh, he, he underwent a limited amputation of the first and second two and with the, the good results finally. The difficulty we have actually is um, with peripheral vascular disease. What we noted is like when we see peripheral vascular disease, the final issue is amputation. Let it be amputation of the two or maybe of the leg because we don't have revascularization available. And when, if you, if you have a, a small, a limited ischemia in one or two tools like this, when you just started to uh, do the amputation of the tools, you will see that the ischemia will be extended. And finally, you, you will go to uh, the, the amputation of the whole leg. So in our setting, actually, what I'm fighting, I think it's just prevention. Prevention by the education of health of professionals to take time to examine um, carefully patient, especially their food, to identify minor signs of infection, neuropathy or peripheral vascular disease, and then finally to, 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 to give the gradation of risk of this, uh, the, the food, as you can see here with the uh, colors uh, in this food uh, with high risk of vaso. And then establish the follow-up of patient because uh, between our patient, the same patient, when you see them, 80% 80 80 of patients admitting the hospital with diabetes food, they are not regularly seen at their consultation, 80%. Diabetic patient and their families also are needed to be educated through this map, map compensation where we have the specific, uh, the specific um, focus on diabetic food. They should learn how to choose the best shoes, best socks, how to cut the nails, and etc how to identify minor signs of HALSA and then to come to the hospital, not waiting. But the big challenge is, the big challenge is, sorry, oh yeah. Okay, also we tried to, to do uh, some um, uh, uh, program with media to educate people with, uh, with diabetes, sorry, or through the media for them to, to learn and to know how to treat themselves through the media with some um, local uh, uh, TV channels here. We just explained to them how to choose the shoes, how to, when to come to the hospital when it's needed, because when we see it, it's like when they come, it's very, very late, as you can see 80% with. Um, Thank you for so 
So this uh, TV program we, we, we conduct with some channels here. So the weaknesses actually uh, in our uh, settings like evidence-based international recommendations are not always, not always accepted. Accepted by health care professionals. Like I've been trained all the time you tell them that, um, for example, use, use simply normal saline to, uh, 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 to clean your, your, your wounds. They don't believe, they don't trust, and they just do as they've been used to do, as like uh, uh, they don't know about evidence in, uh, uh, as recommended. We have lack of specific program uh, at the, the level of the Ministry of Health. There are still lack of awareness, even still we are fighting. And that lack of actors, of course, we don't have pediatrics and educators on diabetics, food. Technical, technical platform is still insufficient. As you see, we don't have uh, revascularization available. And there are still, as everywhere in Africa, some myth and traditional practices, which um, uh, do that patient come too late to the hospital. Because when they go to the traditional areas, some of them, they just say, don't go to the hospital. If you go to the hospital, you die. And then coming to the hospital for some patient is like, the last issue, instead of being the first. And then we see this uh, patient with uh, 64 patients come to the hospital, they come to the, to the stage of Simbad, five or six, 64 patients. So the delay is too high. And that's still weak for us to improve management. So in conclusion, you can say that diabetic food in Congo is still frequent in a, in a hospital in settings actually. And the food care, it requires multidisciplinary team approach and uh, not every actor has, uh, are really uh, involved in concerning this, uh, in this problem in Congo. The international recommendation and protocols are used in, uh, with, with limitations. And we, are, we have some lack of resources and technical platform and the amputation rate, as you can see, and mortality is, mortality is still high. And then for us, we can say that the cornerstone actually is education and earlier screening of the diabetic food to reduce amputation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Patricia. That was a very good overview of your country. And I always say that keep it simple. Whatever we have it, we should use it in our uh, country where we are poor resources, but we can still do one. Thank you very much. Thank you. Coming to our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. James from Kenya. He's a public health specialist from Kenya, and he is also a Deep Food International representative from Kenya, member of several organizations, external review of International Working Group on Diabetic Food and Prevention Guidelines, and a founder of Diabetic Food Foundation of Kenya, uh, geared towards the advocacy and creating awareness and prevention of diabetic food complications among healthcare workers and, and public. He is a recipient of two presidential awards as he continues serving the humanity, Order of a Great Warriors of Kenya and Head of State uh, Commendation Military Division. Uh, you are welcome and his topic is advocacy and need for interdisciplinary team approach on limb prevention. Welcome, Dr. James. Floor is yours. James. Thank you, Prof. Can you see my slide? Yes, we can see it. Okay, good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for yet another opportunity to share our experiences with our colleagues from different parts of Africa. My, my, my topic today is on advocacy and need for interdisciplinary team approach, and my work is so easy because much of it has been said, and uh, as as we start with, the, I'm sharing my screen. My, the, the, there is why advocacy is need preservation. We all know that advocacy is an activity by the individual or a group that aims to influence decision in political, economic, and social institutions. And when we talk of advocacy in, deep, in food care and especially interdisciplinary team approach, we need the political goodwill. We talked a lot about resources, so economical situations are there. We need the social 
institutions which are our health facilities, both private and public institutions. And uh, as we all know, the as we approach the year 2024, we are 2045, we are, Africa is likely to have the highest increase of diabetes food, uh, diabetes uh, prevalence in the world. Uh, know that the diabetes food complication still poses a social, economic, ecological, and physical impact to people living with diabetes. Uh, the speakers who are there before me have alluded to this, and a few studies that were, were, have been done, I quoted them, have indicated an increasing trend of diabetes related to ARIM, with an estimated global prevalence of diabetes food translation at 6.3. The prevalence of diabetes food neuropathy as far as systematic review that was done in Africa revealed that there is 46% of diabetes for neuropathy, with the highest prevalence that was reported in West Africa at 49.4. There are a few studies that have been done in our, in our country that revealed 44.6% in one of our referral hospital, and above all, 47% of these people with diabetes who translation had neuropathic ulcers, 30 had ischemic ulcers, and 18 had neuroschemic ulcers, which causes a burden. And we, as we continue with diabetes food education and our awareness, it is high time in Africa we embark on research because data is very key to our situation. Another study that revealed the high burden of uncontrolled glycemic. Two studies revealed that between 85 to 90 percent of diabetes patients have never had their feet screened by a clinician, despite having a mean diabetes duration of eight years, which is a very key concern to us. In Kenya, out of one of the study that uh, classified the, the, the diabetes risk stratification revealed that 20% of the participants out of 150 were categorized as having a high risk of developing diabetes food. While as 36 had moderate, 37 no risk, and only seven had no risk of developing a diabetes. The diabetes food, as we all know, remains a neglected problem in low resource settings where Africa and Sub Saharan Africa is one of low resource settings. And this has been as a result of high late undiagnosed diabetes with poor control of blood glucose. And most patients, as I have earlier alluded, was 89% controlled blood glucose. Then there is poor practice on cell food examination due to a possible lack of awareness of importance of food screening and lack of empowerment of the patient on the need that they should always have their feet examined both at the hospital and at their homes. Then there is late representation as one of our speakers said to the clinics and hospitals. Most patients present while well, it's too late in hospitals, and these in many times resort to preventable amputation. There is lack of multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary team approach. There are no clear referral pathways. And this is not only in Kenya, it's, it has been touched in most of our, our speakers' presentation. There is inaccessible and inappropriate food accessories like shoe wear, where most of the patients don't have a clear guide on where to go and get their feet, their, sh their shoes. And this poses an increased risk in injuries, infection, and prolonged need. There is always inadequate training on diabetes food and few diabetic food specialists. As, as our sister from South Africa said, 
we have very few podiatrists in the region. And patients are usually not screened during the routine check. Just like the way they are to screened for the eyes, they're screened for their blood sugar, repeat profiles, they're screened for their hearts, they're screened for kidneys. Very few of our clinicians are able to do this. Podiatry is practiced, but still not yet recognized as a subspeciality. I know there are activities and processes that are ongoing with the Ministry of Health to try and see how we can train more foot health, especially bearing in mind that training a podiatrist will take maybe three to four years. But maybe as, as I was discussing with our, with our uh, incoming president, we need to train more nurses and clinicians to take up this role because like in Kenya, health is devolved and we have 47 county government. So if in every county we are able to train a few health, food health professionals, we are able to make this team a great multidisciplinary team. So few of those who are trained also are mostly in the city. So you find that in the periphery, there are very few people who even know how to examine a foot of a diabetic patient. Then there is lack of diagnostic kits. Simple monofilament tuning forks are not available. There is limited demand for food screening due to lack of awareness and need for food screening. Then on the other hand, we've experienced little or limited resources, allocation for diabetes, prevention and control, including diabetes food. This resort to families getting their resources depleted and it ends up causing low quality of life to many of the patients. Our national health insurance does not cover preventive or promotive care of most of the diabetic food activity. And it only caters for some diagnostic and medication. Why interdisciplinary lead? We all know that interdisciplinary refers to a method or mindset that merges traditional education concept or method in order to arrive to a new approach. And that is why as uh, DFOOT international members, we are gathered here to make sure we cannot only come up with interdisciplinary teams in different countries, but we can make it a regional concern and take this matter to another level. As an interdisciplinary team approach is effective method of food care, we need to establish comprehensive diabetes test centers of excellence. And most patients having poor control of sugar, this is very key because when we convert a team of experts under one roof, we are likely not to miss these gaps that are there. We need to develop, I know in our country we developed a national diabetes um, clinical guideline, which has also some elements of diabetes food care. Although even the few trained officers are normally assigned other duties outside the diabetes clinic. So developing effective and evidence-based policies and guidelines on diabetes and food management. On the other hand, is to train an interdisciplinary team of health professionals so that they can enhance good health system on diabetes and food care. Most patients prevent, well, it is too late, resorting to amputation, which of course we know 85% of these amputations are preventable. Increase the sensitization of people living with diabetes, and most importantly, early diagnosis and screening. And also, on the other hand, to ensure that healthcare workers engage patients and caregivers. A very important uh, commitment that we can leverage on is that most of the head of state last year committed and signed a global compact on diabetes as we were celebrating 100 years of discovery of insulin. And these will increase awareness 
an investment of diabetes care and mostly research, which we can work on implementation science to improve the universal health coverage by involving all the stakeholders involved in diabetes and non-communicable care. And, and the vision for global impact, which we can always leverage on, was to reduce the risk of diabetes and ensure that all people who are diagnosed with diabetes have access to equitable, comprehensive, affordable, and quality treatment and care. And this one, diabetes food, can also be part of this mission and vision of global impact by head of state. And until the interdisciplinary approach is embraced, food care will be less optimal, predisposing patients to food complications which are preventable. And in summary, we need to, these are some of the activities that I do on going to business, educating patients so that they can be able to identify their risk. And these are some of the things that have been read it so well and uh, by international working group on diabetes food they have talked of ensuring that we can i mean empower patients to be able to uh, uh, get um, look at the risk of having diabetes food complication and having good footwear and most of the other things we is involved in media awareness this is a media personality when I was giving a lecture in the media on how to identify the risk and foot examination, because with few podiatrists and few foot experts, if we empower and create more advocacy and awareness, which will lead to many Kenyans and many people within the region, we are able to prevent so many amputations and limb preservation will be a dream come true. We also need to have a lot of integrated care by training health care professionals. And last but not the least, we need to treat the ulcer and infection. These are some of my references. I acknowledge a few of uh, my partners and my colleagues. And in Kenya, we mostly have a lot of agris. So food care is key to us, and teamwork will always make us go to another level and prevent our patient from getting the agony of having their feet amputated. I thank you all. Thank you very much, James. That was nice, very good. And that was one step ahead. There's a milestone in Africa, multidiscipline and interdiscipline. It was nice hearing from you. Thank okay, you. Uh, you're welcome. Okay, coming to uh, uh, another speaker from uh, Burkina Faso, Dr. Sagna. He's an endocrinologist at the University of Boni Service Medicine and uh, uh, Sano, uh, Burkina Faso. His topic is diabetic food in Burkina Faso. Welcome, Dr. Sagna. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abbas. And uh, I would like to thank the uh, Food International to, for allowing me to share uh, our experience on diabetic food in uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, so, uh, diabetes, diabetes in uh, Burkina Faso, uh, the prevalence of diabetes in uh, uh, in my country is uh, uh, about 5% uh, when we performed the WHO steps in uh, 2013. And uh, the people over uh, 15 years is uh, a, a almost half of the total population. Uh, we don't have the prevalence of uh, diabetic food in uh, Burkina Faso. But uh, all related uh, hospitalization uh, for diabetes is related, all the diabetes related hospitalization in uh, internal medicine department. Uh, of them, there is almost 15% uh, case 
of uh, diabetic foot. And uh, our patient is uh, characterized by the severity of uh, the presentation uh, and the, the infection as we are, will show you in the following slides. So the infection, I, I, I say uh, our uh, patient with uh, uh, diabetic foot is uh, characteriz characterized by a positive cultures uh, with uh, uh, mainly ground positive uh, cocci, uh, it's Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, there is not a lot of gram negative uh, uh, bacilli, uh, but I saw, I saw uh, but, uh, that in, in uh, Congo, if Dr. Ilinga, uh, there, there is a lot of gram negative, but in our setting, it's a gram positive uh, coxy. Uh, and uh, there's gram positive coxy as are highly sensitive to amoxicillin and uh, acidic clavulanic uh, uh, antibiotics. Uh, there, there, is, there, there are no methicillin resistant uh, uh, microbe. And uh, for the, the, the becoming of uh, diabetic food, the percentage of uh, amputation of uh, lower limb segment uh, over than 50%, and the mortality rate is 33.3%. Uh, uh, so there are a lot of uh, diffs in uh, our country for uh, diabetic uh, food. We have to face some, some uh, barriers and challenges. As you see, uh, some uh, some pictures of uh, uh, some patients we receive in uh, our department, because uh, people are not uh, sufficiently informed about the risk factors of uh, uh, diabetes and diabetic foot, so uh, it results on a delayed consultation delayed management of, of uh, patient and uh, they present uh, they usually present with uh, some uh, severe lesion and the uh, diabetic foot car is very expensive for our patient uh, and uh, even it's, it's uh, expensive in uh, public hospital there is no uh, government funding to, to help patients when they come with uh, diabetic foot. So some tips have been, have been done. Uh, since a uh, few years, we start with basic training of uh, mainly nurses and general practitioners uh, on the management of diabetic foot infection. Uh, and uh, gen general surgeons, because we don't have a uh, lot of uh, surgeon, uh, general surgeons in uh, our country. And uh, there, uh, when uh, we send some patients with diabetic uh, foot to see them, they usually say, uh, we have no time, we have a lot of uh, work, so uh, you can't... Uh, uh, Take your patient, you have to, to normalize her glycemic. Uh, there, there are some uh, words that like them, like this. So uh, it's difficult for a lot of patients to have a correct care from uh, surgeons. And uh, in Ouagadougou, the capital, and in Bogodi Lasso, where there is the the, the, the tertiary uh, level or the, the, the hospital with tertiary level of car, we try to set uh, a diabetic foot unit K in uh, the two uh, internal medicine department. But uh, as we see, 
we have to face a, a, a lack of equipment because our platform is uh, very, very uh, small. So uh, this is some, uh, some, some big problem in our uh, setting to uh, manage uh, diabetic food. So to conclude, diabetic food reach uh, almost 15 of all diabetes related hospitalization in our country. As you saw, you first to you have to first to end stage lesion. Most of infection can be successfully treated by standard uh, antibiotics. We don't have uh, government funding, but we want to progressively set, setting up some uh, micro car program uh, in uh, the other hospital in the other region, not only in uh, the capital of Agadugu and the second to big city, Bobodilaso, but in the other region where there are uh, some internal medicine uh, uh, specialists or some uh, general surgeons who want to help us in, to, to, to take care of uh, patients with uh, diabetic foot. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sadna. Uh, it was a very nice and uh, I, I, I've been reading your publications. Keep doing good work. Very good. Thank you. Uh, with such you, a Sarah. small resources, you are publishing a lot. And, and I would love to work with you as well. Maybe you can set up with all the audience here, here in uh, uh, some type of study okay. in Africa. Well, uh, okay. Okay. Now uh, it's the the last presenter. I don't see him. Um, I think he's been uh, due to internet problem or whatever from Zanzibar. So we don't have it. So we can open it for the question answer. Anyhow, so this was a fantastic overview. We we had all the aspect of uh, of nurse how to train them. We had a surgeon and a podiatrist. Coming to you, the, Dr. Gill, because I see Felicia has also left. Uh, you know, PAD is coming up very fast. And um, as I've also shown 10 years ago that now there is no difference between Indian, African, or, or a European. It's all the same like neuropathy. And I see now diabetic foot is becoming a baby of uh, surgeons now. Is from physician is going to surgeon. So what do you think we should do with uh, our surgeons in Africa, in our continent. Thank you, Dr. Abbas. Yes, that's actually very true that uh, the diabetic foot is actually becoming more and more of a surgical problem. So what we need to do with our surgeons is first of all to, if possible, train them in uh, vascular interventional procedures. Uh, and then the general and orthopedic surgeons to train them exactly how to do proper debridements and uh, amputations that are also functional, for example, a TMA or a baloney amputation. So some of those things have to also be done as a teamwork in conjunction with the vascular surgeon, the general surgeon, the orthopedic surgeon, because what happens is that in our setup, if a patient lands up in the hands of an orthopedic surgeon, they first get an amputation. And then later on, they say, okay, fine, it's not healing, maybe it's a vascular problem. So let's just do a CT angiogram at that point. I think right from the outset, one should see that if there are no foot pulses, and most of these patients don't have it, we, and the renal function is normal, let's get a CT angiogram. If the CT angiogram is not normal, let's involve a vascular specialist, which could be a vascular surgeon, could be an interventional radiologist, could be an interventional cardiologist who has uh, wire skills to do some of these procedures. So I think it has to be actually a multidisciplinary team uh, thing, and there, there needs to be more training and uh, more awareness that we can try to save as much of the foot as possible rather than just going for amputations. Thank you. Uh, really, you, you, you said it very well. So I will catch you. 
in, in my okay. town. <laughs> for the surgeon. That's very nice answer you get. Thank you. Coming Thank you. to uh, South Africa, Dr. Tish Shidi, you know, um, we, uh, I have started training long time ago our surgeons, uh, uh, nurses, to work as a mini surgeon or a podiatrist. And uh, there was always being a tug of war People didn't like that, but you know, nurses are our backbone. Uh, you cannot do, I mean, I, we cannot do anything without nurses. 60, 70, 80 patients, they are really, work, they work hard and they need to be trained. So uh, here we need you uh, for in Africa. We need to train, uh, as we call it, fast track. Fast track training, and we can only target uh, nurses because Apart from South Africa, maybe there are few in North Africa who has podiatrists. Otherwise, almost none existing. Uh, maybe you can have isolated one here, two here, and we are 54 countries. So what do you say about that? I, I, I think it will always be a tug of war in terms of um, training nurses as podiatrists. Um, because podiatrists would see that as their work being taken away. However, the, the challenge is that we do not have enough podiatrists. Maybe we should um, look into interrelational um, education in terms of training full-time podiatrists or training the nurses to be podiatrists. So instead of them just doing nursing work, they do a full course on podiatry and and they can be the podiatrist of that country because they already have the medical background. Um, and, and it's important to also know that, like you're saying, we, we it's, you know, the, the number of podiatrists in Africa, it's, it's so little, but the, the, the continent is so big. So there needs to be um, a structure in, oh, it, that will allow us to train for podiatrists so that they can go back into the respective countries and start doing their work. But obviously it starts with those who are already in practice who can assist those countries to, to function better. Basic foot assessment, I think it's important. And we also train nurses to do basic screening. Do you see a problem? Do you have a podiatrist in your area? Then send to the podiatrist. We, we, we encourage that because most of the time uh, patients walk in, in and out of, of um, consultation rooms without their feet being checked uh, because we're looking more at the glycemic control. So it's key. We need to start pushing forward as to fast checking um, med med uh, our medical professionals like nurses to be podiatrists. Yeah, I, I agree with you, but the training would take two, three years, isn't it? Hmm. it yeah, and, and if then... you have a, it, if you have a medical background, it doesn't necessarily take that long because you have some um, modules that you would get accreditation for and nurses do more. That's another thing. So when we when we look back, it might actually take, that's what I'm saying, it needs a proper structure where we are not also shortchanging the nurses, but we're also in, uh, raising and creating a better, um, a better uh, position for the profession. You, you know, um, time is not in our favor, but uh, what yeah. you are saying is, is been, I've been talking for past 25, 30 years. And um, it, like Jam said, most of the African countries, we don't know podiatrists, we know pediatricians. Mm -hmm. uh, they are not even on the list. So when you come back mm -hmm. to your country, you are like nothing. So what we need is something, a certificate to start with to save the food. Mm -hmm. Okay. Coming to, uh, and I think the two, four, two, four questions, uh, four questions which I've already answered uh, to these discussions. Uh, Dr. Chale, there is a question from you, uh, Professor Philip, I think. He's asking regarding uh, prosthesis in your country. Well, yeah. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah, as you see, yeah, we have a high rate of amputation. Of course, we need a to be uh, collaborating with the prosthetists in the, in, the, in the area here. But what I know in Point Noir where I work actually, we don't have any center, we don't have any resources. But I usually uh, collaborate with a young man who was trained in Togo, uh, which I usually contact when the, some of my patients are in need, uh, in need of uh, this uh, 
prosthesis. You usually uh, go to Togo and make for them the prosthesis. And then himself is like um, uh, a, a trainer, usually to train the patient how to work with the new prosthesis. That's in Point Noir. But in Brazzaville, there is a center. It's a kind of public center, but I don't have any experience working with them. Well, I know some of my patients usually go to Brazzaville. And I know that what they usually get from this center is not really, really a good one. So I've, the, I've, I've seen even some patients uh, they just start and they drop finally uh, the prosthesis. So uh, Point Noir is the second city of, of Congo, uh, one, one million people, no center available. Only one guy well, can collaborate directly with him because he was trained. I even called him to work to my hospital, to my hospital but he refused. So it's very, very good, very uh, difficult issue for patient after amputation uh, when they are here in Point Noir. And anyway, it's very expensive also. This young man doing this uh, from Togo, he usually travels to, to, to Togo, it's like maybe two or three thousand dollars for him to go to, to, to uh, to, to, to make uh, something like suitable. Uh, so it's very difficult for a patient after the operation here actually in Point Noir, yeah. And the cheaper one in, in, in Brazil is very cheap, but very cheap, it means very, very heavy. Some of them, they kind of work with it, they kind of use, I've seen some of them and they just decide to drop uh, at the end. Okay, uh, we are almost approaching 11.15 in East Africa and tomorrow is a working day. Uh, maybe last last question because James is, is waiting for a question. Uh, James, you are in touch with public. So can you briefly say how to go about and teach public? Is it through health workers or you do it directly? Uh, I can even see Dr. Gill's melatonin in training. Now, what I can say is this, uh, just as uh, Dr. Bonani has said, we need uh, the public to own uh, the challenges that we have because if the health system are not because in africa unlike uh, europe we have we don't have a well-structured health system yes we are trying we are not where we were some years back but we need to empower the patient and the caregivers we need to do a lot of awareness to the public and uh, this will come a long way by building the health literacy to the public because when the public is more aware, like I've seen whenever I go on TV, because I'm given free airtime by some local channels, I am able to assist even healthcare workers in other regions of the country because they call me and they tell me, we saw you talking about diabetes foods. How can we go about it? And then there are things that will be so unique to us is embrace telemedicine because we got a lesson during COVID where there were lockdowns in the world. So if I'm able to read Dr. Bonani and tell her, send I have been getting assisted a lot by Dr. Abbas and, and Dr. Armstrong because I send them photos of foot ulcers. And, and within no time we are able to compare notes and uh, get to where we are supposed to be. So let's, let's do a lot of health advocacy and uh, we will be able to remember this day on, uh, on 8th November 2022 and say we started it and this is where we are one year down the line. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, I see Felicia has just joined it, but uh, yes. Dr. Chale and Dr. Saguna, I want to tell you that uh, next year we, I'm going to be president of D4. And I really want to involve the West Africa. So I would be depending on you people. And this is an opportunity I'm telling you that uh, okay. we need more doctors from Africa. Felicia, last question to yes. you. Okay, uh, okay. It was that, that program which you did to educate the nurses, uh, yes. can you briefly tell us, because with us it's almost 11.30 we are reaching here in East Africa. So can you yeah. tell us briefly? Okay, uh, the program on, of the nurses on wound care? Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, what we had, it was, um, we had our um, um, Nigerian Endocrine Society meeting. And so I 
invited um, a podiatrist from the US and he came and trained the nurses on wound care. That was all he came to do at that meeting. So we, we selected nurses from about 22 government health facilities that he trained on wound care with practical. Um, Dr. Abbas was in Nigeria and um, we had a, a training when we were doing a um, diabetic food podiatry program. The nurses that were trained on wound, wound care were also trained by Dr. Abbas when he came for that program in Nigeria. So it's the same set of nurses that we had been training. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, all the speakers. I'm really very grateful. Thank you. I hope you all enjoy. And sorry for East Africans to make you wait till 1130. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I look forward to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.